Hi, welcome to Tab's Two Cents. Today on the show, we have Justin Klein. Justin is the co-host of the Invest Talk podcast and radio show, and he's the CEO of KPP Financial. Today on the show, we're going to talk about how to analyze stocks. We start with a Canadian favorite, Shopify. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Tab's Two Cents, the show where we discuss multiple income streams and macro factors affecting the world today. Hey, Justin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. I was wondering if you could just uh, start with a little introduction for the listeners, let everybody know what you do. Sure. Yeah, so I'm the uh, co-host of Invest Talk podcast, uh, and we've been doing that for, I've been doing that for uh, over 15 years. Uh, my It's been going on for longer than that. My, my grandfather, who's my mentor, uh, he's been doing it since the mid-90s, or had been doing it. He, he recently passed. But uh, I also, we also have an investment firm called, uh, Klein Pavis and Peasley financial. We short shortened it to KPP financial. Uh, I am the CEO and, uh, run asset allocation strategies and, uh, obviously help clients, uh, navigate their own personal situation. Um, invest talk is a radio show. It airs on AM 1220 in the Bay area. Uh, and we put it out as a podcast, uh, usually we have about a million downloads a month and it's a call-in show. People call in, ask questions about uh, the, the market, uh, the economy as a whole, as well as individual stock names, which uh, I know we're going to get into uh, one today. So uh, you know, I've been doing this for north of 20 years. Uh, I was licensed at a very young age. So uh, a lot of experience in the industry and, uh, and, and the process of looking at uh, individual names and how to think about them. Uh, on both sides, risk and reward, because uh, that's how every investment should be viewed. When I saw your profile pop up on my radar, I thought this guy would be perfect for an episode I wanted to film, which was, you know, how to do a proper due diligence process. Because I know when I first started out, I'd be reading through, everybody says, make sure you do your DD, make sure you do your DD. And I'm like, how do I do that? And and I understand everybody's different, but they're certainly needs to be a basic knowledge of what a good due diligence looks like. So mm-hmm. I know we talked before the show, I threw Shopify out there and you said, yeah, that's a great stock here in Canada. Obviously it's a big one. So mm-hmm. I wonder if we could maybe just start with a little bit of on the surface, what you'd look for in a company just in the beginning of a, of a process. And we can kind of work from there. Well, the first thing I didn't think about until you just said that was uh, the fact that it's a Canadian company and there is kind of this Canadian curse with the companies that get really, really big in Canada. Think of uh, uh, research in motion and, and Blackberry and obviously Apple kind of took them down and Shopify has been this latest one and they've had a, a quite the fall. So uh, something to to think about research promotion and uh, now that is now it's called BlackBerry uh, is still in business and I don't see Shopify going out of business but the the better question is is it a good investment now when you talk about due diligence I think of due diligence more in private companies you know uh, the the rules around gap accounting and and audit practices etc uh, on public companies certainly go a long way to helping the due diligence process, but doesn't mean you can't do a little more deep dive into uh, their financials and how they are accounting for various things in order to get a better sense of whether they're being aggressive with their accounting practices or more conservative. Uh, But that takes a lot of real business knowledge and understanding balance sheets and and how to read uh, income statements and things like that. And, you know, kind of too much for us to really get into now, but that's, that's more of a DD. Uh, I think of it more as the investment analysis process. I don't really call that DD, but if you want to call that DD, that's great. The way that we look at things are both uh, from the top down, uh, then the bottom up, um, and then there's technical analysis, which would be you know the chart. When most people are looking at particular companies, they're looking uh, the bottom up, I meaning they're looking at the financials, the story, the trends in the marketplace, the sector, et cetera, hopefully, at least some of that, and ideally more. Um, but then there's the top down that, uh, which is the macro uh, economic environment uh, and whether or not uh, that lines up, especially in the, sh- in the more short to medium term, uh, because that ultimately is going to drive the share price uh, over that, that, that short to medium term time frame. Uh, because the cost of capital, you see that now with interest rates going up, that certainly impacts uh, many companies, some more than others. Obviously, real estate related, anything that is uh, leveraged to the uh, housing market, for example, uh, but also growth companies. And you've seen that recently, uh, where really since the Fed started to raise rates and, and become less accommodative, 
the the growth side of the market has taken a big big hit you see now with the pelotons in the world the zooms of the world and the shopify's of the world and shopify uh is now down let's see from its high 83 percent. and the big question and, and the first uh, thing that most uh, people will say is well it's it's down it's cheap uh i should buy it because it's going to get back to those levels first thing you have to understand is no, nothing's guaranteed and it's never guaranteed to return to those levels um, so that in itself does not make it a good investment. But going back to the macro backdrop, um, you have to figure out whether the, you know, the economy is going to be accelerating, is inflation going up or is it going down? Uh, are interest rates expected to go up or down? And that will feed into uh, the, the multiples that these companies are trading at. And that's really what's happened here is the multiples on these names have come down dramatically. And for many of them, uh, they will come down more and some have been completely washed out and, uh, you know, kind of baby thrown out the bathwater. Uh, Shopify uh, currently is still trading at pretty high multiples. And so it's going to have to continue to grow, not just the top line, but the bottom line, especially in this environment where the cost of capital is no longer zero. You are going to need businesses that make profit, make positive cash flow and aren't out there just issuing shares. And so those are the things that, uh, and issuing shares to finance their, their business. And that's really been a trend over the past uh, number of years. And so these are the things that I tend to look at when I'm trying to decide whether uh, the short to medium term outlook uh, makes sense. If the interest are going up, inflation is uh, consistent, uh, that tends to hurt uh, growthier type of names. So that's the first thing, and I would say it would be a negative for Shopify, would be that, that macro backdrop, both higher inflation or higher interest rates, as well as a slowing consumer. Uh, they were produced, they were consuming a lot of uh, goods back during the pandemic, and that has uh, reversed, right? A lot of people couldn't go out and spend money on eating out and traveling and things like that. So they had money in their pocket, and what do they do? They're sitting on their couch, and they bought a lot of things that were on Shopify websites, and that helped Shopify a great deal. They're only making three cents a share in 2019, 2020 made 40 cents, 2021, 64 cents this year, they're supposed to lose 10 cents. So you see that huge reversal in their business. And if you look at their free cash flow, it has gone from 600, let's see what was the peak, 615 million, now down to 58 million and probably had a negative over the next few quarters. So, you know, that's the macro side. That's the, that's, that's looking at the, the company itself and trying to decipher whether they actually have a viable, consistent, sustainable business that isn't COVID related. You know, I, I point to Peloton as a great example of the fact that they couldn't make money during the pandemic in the best possible environment they could ever hope for, right? And Shopify, frankly, it's kind of the same way. Now, good thing they made money. So that's a positive compared to Peloton. But now that things are reversing, we're having that uh, kind of return to normal, you know, can they sustain their profitability? And what I'm seeing is no, you know, the return equity right now is now negative 18%, whereas it hit a high of 39% in September of 2021. So, you know, I, I don't see a whole lot lining up very well uh, on the macro or the micro side for Shopify. And then you look at the chart, it continues to be weak below all the major moving averages, just consolidating right here in between 30 and $40 per share. And anytime a stock has a move in one direction, and then kind of trades in a, in, a, in a range for a while, that's consolidation. Sometimes that's bullish consolidation if the previous move was higher, or it's bearish consolidation if the previous move was lower. And with Shopify, the previous move was certainly lower. So, you know, those are the things that I look at when I look at Shopify and just doesn't seem like a, a name that uh, I would want to own anytime soon. Uh, I definitely would need to see uh, the data kind of renormalize uh, on the economy as a whole and probably recover for the economy, right? Because uh, you want people spending more on websites as opposed to less. If the economy weakens, the labor market weakens, you know, they're going to be spending less on websites uh, that Shopify runs. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot to impact there. Definitely from the macro perspective, Shopify doesn't have a lot of good momentum going its way. And and something that I've noticed with tech stocks, especially is they, they grab onto that momentum and, you know, either bullish or bearish, they really go for it. And uh, they're just such a volatile space, it seems like. I mean, I even know Meta, how, how much has Meta lost off its market cap, you know, lately. And so with these big tech names, it feels like they really need that macro push behind them to get some juice. Yeah, that's certainly true. And, and going back to your tech comment, 
you know, there was a lot of money that was pushed out there in the economy into people's bank accounts. And it was shown that a lot of people bought stocks, right? The, the rush record numbers of brokerage accounts set up, et cetera. And, you know, people don't go and buy boring names when you just get involved in the markets and you're trying to make a bunch of money and, and, and you're, you're trading options, you're, you're just trading individual uh, names. Most people latch onto stories and story stocks. And that's what drove a lot of these tech names higher through 2020 and 2021 was that uh, retail uh, trader. And frankly, that retail trader is now uh, going away, right? They're, they're spending money on their, their grocery bill, their utility bill, their rent now that they actually have to pay it or their mortgage that they actually have to pay it. And so uh, that's another big reason why these stocks traded at such egregious multiples. And now that they're down 80, 90%, and I think for most of them, they'll probably stay down there for a long period of time until their actual business uh, gets more real traction. You know, the, the companies to be invested in for the next decade are going to be those businesses that aren't about the story. You know, they're probably more boring businesses. Think of uh, industrial names and, and oil and gas and, and energy and commodities. Those are, those are the companies that are, are likely to make hay uh, in an inflationary environment, uh, whereas more uh, high multiple tech names, uh, consumer cyclical names, those are the ones that are going to be uh, more under pressure as inflation uh, continues to bite uh, throughout the economy and, and multiples contract. And so Shopify is both, right? It's both a consumer cyclical name and a tech name. And that's why it's down so much and likely to you know, stay on the map for some time until their business can show some consistency uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the profitability side, which, uh, you know, outside of the pandemic time, they have not been able to do that. Yeah. And it's interesting you brought up the free cash flow because I noticed that as well. And it, they're moving into negative free cash flow. Mm -hmm. And for me, that that's really something that I like to look at on balance sheets. I know you, you were talking about multiples. And sometimes I remember when I first was looking into this, I was like, what are they talking about? What multiples, you know, like a, what maybe what ratios do you like to look at? Because there's there's quite a few out there. Yeah. So I like to look at enterprise value to EBITDA. Um, that's my probably my favorite uh, just because it encompasses enterprise value is when you're looking at PE, most people look at PE, price to earnings, uh, but both are, are very, very uh, they don't tell the whole picture. Let's just say that um, on the P side, all you're looking at is the market cap and the market cap only is the price the, 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 the company is trading at times the number of shares outstanding. That's the market cap. Uh, that doesn't, and that's, so that's just looking at the equity. But what about the debt? What if the company has a lot of debt or what if a company has a lot of cash on their balance sheet? Luckily for Shopify, they do have a lot of cash. So they're able to de deal with uh, some cash burn right now, which is probably going to be necessary over the next few years. So that's why I like to look at e EV. Um, so the positive is that their enterprise value is actually less than a market cap, still 33 billion, lower than 38 billion a market cap, but uh, it's good if they have some cash. Then EBITDA, that's filtering out a lot of the non-cash charges. So uh, depreciation, amortization, that's a depre you know, depreciation on buildings, for example, that oftentimes are not uh, really depreciating value. Same with amortization, amortizing um, certain assets like brands. Uh, those things uh, oftentimes don't don't lose value, uh, and so you know it's more of a cash flow measure, even is than earnings, which can be uh, quite manipulated. Um, so that, those are the measures that I like to look at. Now you want to compare them to the industry uh, as a whole. I like to see them generally in the teens or lower, um, preferably the single digits. But once again, it depends on the industry. Some industries tend to trade at higher. Uh, EBITDA, EBITDA is others uh, a bit lower. So uh, that's important. Now with Shopify, there's no EBITDA, right? So it's negative. So you can't really calculate it there. Now price sales ratio is seven times, 7.7 .7 actually. Anything above 10 is, you, is historically, it's extremely, 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 extremely hard to find a lot of examples of companies that are able to, that are actually good investments when they're trading at over 10 times uh, price of sales. And frankly, you know, a year or two ago, many names were trading at 20 times, which is absolutely egregious. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, most of those names have corrected, uh, but still 7.7 .7 times is still pretty high. Uh, you know, I like to see that under three, uh, preferably. Now, once again, more software names, high, high margin businesses, they're going to trade at, at higher price sales ratios. That's just uh, how, how it is. So it certainly depends on the company, depends on the industry, but 7.7 .7 times is still very, very high. So uh, it's still trading to me at a, at a high multiple 
for what the uh, what what the business is doing, both on the sales side and the profitability side. Yeah, and price to sales is good because you get to see you know how the business is doing without you know looking at certain aspects of the business that may hold it back. But it, I do find that that one is a little bit tricky because it, it's not you know net net income. So it's you know we got negative free cash flow. Maybe the price to sales is you know, doing well, and it might be hidden in that ratio. So I, I like your approach where you look at a couple different ratios together and kind of, you know, yeah, you definitely want to look, you want to look at a, a lot of different ratios, you know, price to sales is good for I actually like it more in a recessionary environment where there isn't a lot of E, but there, there's continuous sales. So what happens in a recessionary environments, companies have to uh, unload uh, their their products, usually margins get hit. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling because uh, the economy in general is struggling, but their business generally reverts to the mean, right? When the economy recovers, but their sales are tend to be relatively consistent. And so, you know, short-term factors can impact the overall profitability of the business. Uh, but if longer term, that profitability is uh, usually there, uh, price of sales, the low price sales ratios can really tip you off to, hey, this company is cheap because once they turn return to a normal operating environment, normal economic environment, uh, this is going to, you know, revalue much, much higher back to what it normally trades at. That's, that's when I like to use uh, price to sales ratio, both on the low side and uh, the high side, you know, kind of when it's in the middle one to four, four, you know, it doesn't really tell me a whole lot usually, but when it's north of five, uh, especially north of 10, uh, it's very difficult for companies to be great investments when their price sales ratio is, is that high. So the fact that Shopify 7.7, .7, I think that needs to be sub five before you even think about uh, making this uh, a decent, uh, decent investment. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great take on price to sales. And it's, a, it's important to look at the ratios and understand what they are and what's the best way to utilize those numbers. I think, I yeah. think you did a good job there with price to sales. And uh, one thing I want to ask you about is when we talk about certain stocks, it's easy to find information on popular ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Shopify, for example, got a lot of attention just based on our ETFs interest in shop. Mm -hmm. So Kathy Woods fund. Mm -hmm. And I just wrote down here, it, it's actually a fairly substantial part of the ETF. So I looked at, you know, their holdings, Zoom's 10%, Tesla's 8.7%. Mm -hmm. And then you got Shopify 3.3%. So I think, you know, in comparison, it's only, you know, it's less than three times what they have of Tesla and you know how much of a bull she is on Tesla. When yeah. you're looking at these stocks, like, and you look at these funds and you look at these different fund managers, how much of that do you take into consideration? Uh, none at all. I think Kathy Wood is one of the worst analysts I've ever seen in my career. She got hot during a time when, you know, these, these names were, there's a lot of money going to these names. Cause like I said, people had cash and they were investing in, uh, you know, the quote unquote innovative stocks, but the vast majority of these names are bad investments. You know, they have negative return on invest in investment capital, return on equity, negative cash flow. You know, their entire business is to tell a story. You know, Tesla is the extreme example. And there's still, you know, the only reason Tesla's trading at where it's now is because there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, just fanboys, uh, Elon fanboys, <laughs> Tesla fanboys, and, you know, just kind of uh, uh, money there that. Uh, is, is fairly sticky. Um, but there's a lot of names within this ETF that remain extremely, extremely overvalued. It, it just look at Zoom, for example. Hey, we're, we're on Zoom, but hey, uh, I use uh, GoTo for my video conference calls with my clients and, and, and my uh, potential clients. So, you know, that's not anything special there. Uh, Roku, uh, obviously falling out of bed, continues to, to struggle. Uh, just I'll tell a doc, another name that it's a great story. But it's, it's not just about having a great idea. It's about executing on a viable business plan. Uh, and the vast majority of these names just can't do that uh, outside of a, a pandemic uh, situation. And so I think, uh, and you should look at ARC, ARC is actually a, a total. It's, uh, it's up from its beginning. But if you look at weighted based on when money, people put money in, it's uh, most vast majority of people have lost money. Uh, and it's been a destroyer of capital overall. So I absolutely would, I, I would actually short uh, uh, the vast majority of what's in like ARC ETFs or what Kathy would spewing, then I would go long. 
and Shopify uh, is, is included in that. And so uh, until uh, what I think is going to happen, this happened in the 90s. Um, John Templeton was uh, the rock star of the, the late 90s. And then suddenly, because he was betting, betting on the, the, the uh, tech sector and the, uh, the internet sector, and you know his star fell when the entire sector rolled over. And same thing happened uh, with ARK and, and uh, the quote unquote innovative stocks. And so you want to be doing the opposite of what Kathy Wood's doing. Uh, in this environment, an inflationary environment, we expect that to be for the next decade plus, be very different than we've experienced in the last 30 years. We're deglobalizing the global supply chains. We are uh, becoming more uh, of a multipolar world with Russia, China, kind of picking their sides uh, along with their uh, potential allies and cutting off a lot of their resources, especially with Russia to the rest of the world. And that means higher uh, commodity prices in general, higher inflation uh, due to all of these factors, aging demographics in China is uh, going to make them, uh, you know, you can't export your labor to them nearly as much. So all these factors mean structurally higher inflation, now lower than what it is now, but still much higher than that one to 2% that we've been used to. Uh, and so names like uh, that, that Kathy Wood has in her portfolio are, are going to continue to struggle. And uh, when she winds up her portfolio uh, and, you know, that whole, whole area gets, uh, the sentiment gets washed out, that's when I think you're going to find actually some very good names amongst the rubble. But we're still in kind of that hope phase that is going to return to what was uh, during the pandemic. And it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And I, I think that's actually a really important lesson, which is don't get caught up in the hype. And mm -hmm. Kathy Wood is a good example of somebody who's very well-spoken. And when you listen to her interviews, you want to believe what she's saying because it all yeah. it all makes sense to some degree, but yeah. it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen, believable it, or not. Exactly. You, you, want, you want to hope that all these companies are going to come out here and solve uh, all of our world problems. And, and frankly, that's what kind of the, the society has turned to. You know, that's why Elon is such a... Every, there's a lot of people that are big Elon fans is because uh, they're looking for somebody or looking for hope that can come in and quote unquote, save the day, no matter uh, the, the, the problems that Elon brings with his, uh, you know, with his brash talk, their, their hope is that, hey, the politicians are terrible. They're not going to do anything good for me, but this entrepreneur can, you know, uh, innovate and, and, and bring about products that are going to be net good for humanity. And, you know, I think there's, as time goes on, you can see that, you know, electric cars, they, they have their merits, but they have their drawbacks. Other companies are getting into it. It's not that special. Uh, they were just the, the first mover. Not to say Elon hasn't innovated uh, to some degree, but he's a lot, a lot, he's left a lot of carnage in his wake. And maybe that's justifiable. It's up to any, every individual to uh, decide on that. But, you know, that's why you have people following these, uh, these entrepreneurs and, and uh, these great stories is because, you know, they're not believing any great stories of politicians anymore. So uh, they, they're, they're going to they're gonna follow it somewhere. Um, and that's kind of where uh, they naturally gra have gravitated to. Yeah. And I, I've noticed that with CEOs and fund managers and, you know, Michael Saylor's another one with Bitcoin and, and the crypto stuff. It seems like there's just a huge following to the story of uh, mm -hmm. destabilizing the financial world. So then I think keeping that in mind, it's important to sort of ground yourself in the numbers. And like we were doing earlier with the ratios and stuff. And, and one, th one thing that I like to do with stocks, I know you're kind of a, an analyst on your own, but I look at, you know, the analysts ratings on these mm -hmm. and, you know, I pulled it up just on the stratosphere website, which is a, uh, it's a great website. I had the owner of the website on my show actually. And right now we've got 11 strong buys for Shopify, one moderate buy 13 holds and one moderate sell with no strong sells, which to me is surprising. That's what I've got for 30 analysts. I'm mm -hmm. um, given all the things that you've said. I agree with you. I think that, you know, obviously can't predict the future, but it does feel like tech globalization, all of these things are slowing down mm -hmm. and they're probably going to struggle, mm -hmm. but yet we still have 11 strong buys. Well, that's uh, just another example that you, you never listen to analysts when it comes to their buy and sell recommendations. It's just the best guess. Uh, a lot of times using multiples, there's a lot of conflicts, especially within big banks where, uh, and you saw that back in the, the late 90s where uh, the investment banks don't want to put out a sell rating because on a, on a particular company because 
They want to be in business. They want to be there to issue stock for them if they want to go to market or issue bonds for them and earn their commissions off that. And so there's often a lot of conflicts of interest uh, there. Uh, and historically, analysts uh, in general, you know, there are one on one off good analysts, but in general, analysts are terrible at picking you know, good buys or good sales. Typically when, when everybody doesn't want to own it anymore, uh, analysts are all selling oftentimes, as long as the business is, you know, long-term viable, that's a good time to buy. Okay. And vice versa. And so you never want to listen to analysts when it comes to buy or sell recommendations that should be thrown out the window. Uh, now, when it's, when you're looking at earnings projections, that's more uh, something that you should, look to an analyst for because analysts do have their, their boots on the ground. They're looking at the industry as a whole. They're talking to executives within the business. They, they do have a pretty good sense of you know, what the earnings are going to be going forward. Now, they typically are a bit more optimistic than they, they should be. They, they typically, the farther out they go, the more optimistic they tend to be about uh, earnings for a company. And then as you get closer to that next earnings report, they try to they just start to ramp that down. I think that's natural. That's that 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 can be expected. But that's really all analysts are really good for is what is that uh, future earnings direction generally going to be, uh, and they're pretty good at that. Not perfect, nobody is, but they're they're pretty good at that. But when it comes to buy or sell recommendations, never think about that. Uh, you have to do your own, as you said at the top of the show, due diligence, macro, micro, uh, technical, etc. Yeah, and I find for me personally, I get sucked into the macro stuff. So a strategy that I've sort of developed is once I really like an industry, like for example, I like oil and gas at the moment, so that's specifically Canadian oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've done is I found a fund manager that I liked, I bought the ETF mm -hmm. rather than trying to pick a individual names because I find that I sort of look for macro tailwinds and I don't necessarily put in as much time as I should to go from the bottom up, as you say. If you had, say, you know, an hour, would you be a half hour for both? Or how would you allocate that time, do you think, for bottom up and top down? Uh, I would definitely probably, I would allocate a little bit more to the top down um, because that, the, that macro environment is going to be so vital to any short or medium term moves uh, in, in that particular name. You could have the best business in the world, but if the world's going to, you know, the economy's going to hell in a handbasket, it's likely to go with it, right? So, uh, you know, you really want to hone on the sector. I do like oil and gas right now because of uh, you know, ESG uh, mandates and increasing demand worldwide and the shutoff of uh, supply from Russia. Uh, and so all of that uh, is going to benefit, like you said, Canadian energy companies, especially. So if that's kind of that, that macro backdrop, both, uh, you know, but then it's fighting with the, the, so that's, that's the, that's almost the micro sector backdrop, but then there's the macro economic backdrop, which, you know, continuing slowing economy, not to a level that is going to, going to erode demand. You really takes a really bad economy overall to erode demand for, uh, energy. In 08, you had only a modest dip in, in, in global demand for energy. So, um, I still continue to think that that's going to grow. But I digress. Uh, but yeah, so I would focus more on the macro side and how that's going to uh, play into the, the business trends. Uh, and then, then I can focus a little bit more on the micro and make sure I'm getting best of breed within the sector. That, that, that usually isn't too hard. You know, you look at long-term profitability metrics, leadership, what their products are, what part, what place in the marketplace are they? Are they the premium brand? Are they just have scale? Uh, the low cost producer, et cetera, you know, and how does that play uh, in, in the medium to long term? Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that's a bit easier than the macro. The macro does take uh, a lot more unpacking because there's a lot more variables. You know, individual companies have, you know, pretty set number of variables from uh, their, their customer base and, the, and their cost inputs. Uh, and if you understand all that, and uh, that can feed into, you know, your long term projections of the, of the business. So that tends to be more straightforward than the macro. So I, I like to as well focus a bit more on the macro. Yeah. And this is something that I struggle with because the overall consensus is that you can't predict macro trends, but for whatever reason, people seem to think if they look at enough financials, they can predict how a company is going to perform, but it's still limited information. You don't know what the CEO is going to do. You don't know if they're going to go through a hard time. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still so many variables to a, a single company. Why do you think that? opinion is out there and how do you feel about that do you think it's easier to predict a single company as opposed to an overall macro i think that i think the macro is frankly a bit easier i mean because i mean it takes more work but 
you know, generally things move in, a, in the same direction, right? You see now with interest rates going up, housing's weakening, you know, housing is going to weaken. Now, which housing stock is going to weaken more than others is uh, a little bit harder to predict. You know, that takes a little more granular uh, focus. Uh, what, uh, what, is the, what are the migration trends in the, uh, in the regions that they operate in? Uh, what are the input costs? They focus on the high end, medium, small, small, uh, you know, small homes, et cetera. So, you know, those things are a bit more difficult to know how the macro backdrop is going to feed into individual names. So it's, it's easier if you just know, if you, if you can pinpoint the macro backdrop, uh, and then that'll help you kind of uh, invest with, the, with the, the wind at your back as opposed to uh, in, in your face. Because, you know, if you're buying consumer cyclical names right now, that's going to be very difficult to earn money, right? Because most of those companies have been over earning for a couple of years, like Shopify, for example, and now uh, their businesses are reverting to the mean. A lot of them have over uh, too much inventory on their balance sheet and they unload that inventory. So margins are getting squeezed, et cetera. So, you know, that's just the nature of the business uh, and why you need to really know your macro uh, before you get into micro. Yeah, there, there's an investor in Canada, Marin Katusa, and he's a big commodities guy. And he was a. Uh, I have his book. Where's his oh, book? Rise of America. Rise of America. Yep, I'm yep. about two thirds through it. Great, great, great book. I'm gonna buy that book. I haven't got it yet, but he was the first guy to pique my interest in carbon credits, which is actually what started me on this entire path of the podcast and website. Mm-hmm. But he was just recently on a podcast uh, called The Next Big Trade, and he's a big gold guy you know, commodities, as you know, if, if you're reading the book, obviously, you know, his history. And I was interested to hear him say, for most sectors, he holds one or two stocks mm-hmm. for carbon credits, for example, two stocks. And I think that that's kind of peak performance, if you can, for lack of a better term, but if you can find the macro trend you like, and then find the best companies within it, and stay yeah. stay isolated to those that that's that's what i would like to do as well yeah i, think. I yeah i don't necessarily disagree with that uh you know they, they there's uh they call it diversification when diversification right they call it diversification yeah. uh and i agree with that to some degree you know we hold yeah usually three four max of of uh one of, of companies within a particular sector um and so you know that's what uh, that's what that's what we do when we manage our, our client accounts. So when you're buying big ETFs that follow a particular uh, trend, uh, then you're you're more getting more diversification. And I always say if you have the time and you have the ability, uh, I would go look at those ETFs and try to find the best within it. Same with like Arc, for example. There's some there's some probably good values of the Arc. There's probably only one or two. Um, but and you got to really dig and really have a, a, a balanced point of view to, to find the right ones. Um, but you, you're, you're probably going to do better uh, by doing some legwork on the back end and finding the best of breed within those particular uh, sectors. Yeah, for sure. And just yeah. a little bit more work. <laughs> like most things, yeah. if you, if you want to do better, you need to work a little bit harder, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I think this has been awesome. I, I know I've found this super helpful for myself. I, I really appreciate your insight on this kind of stuff. I wonder if I could just give you an opportunity to uh, let the listeners know where they can find your content, your show, where how they can, is it streamed live when you, when you film? And Yeah. So we, uh, we stream live on our website, investtalk.com every weekday, four to five Pacific time. So you can call in live and, uh, on air uh, and ask your question. Um, so that's one way you can do it. Um, we also take that live show, record, uh, break it up to about a 45 minute podcast and put that out. Uh, you can find that on any podcast network, iTunes, Spotify, Google play, et cetera, uh, and subscribe. We also have a YouTube channel, which we have some content over there. I do a Friday market breakdown every Friday. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, it's usually about 10 minutes, just going over different, uh, show different charts and, uh, trends that happen in the market and what my read is, uh, based on, uh, you know, what I'm seeing. So, uh, yeah, all of the ways to uh, connect with me uh, through Invest Talk. Awesome. Well, thanks for thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. No problem, Joe. And uh, thank you for reaching out. Yeah, no worries. Have a good- Joe is not a financial advisor and may have interest in the stocks discussed on the show. So do not take any information included within this podcast as a recommendation or formal advice. Thank you. Yeah.